Hello, welcome to Flannel, Croix uh, Tai Crenion. Uh, my name's David Chapman from Ancient Art. In 2005, Travalau's Community Council, Coyd Cymru and Angsley Council's Museum and Cultural Service commissioned Ancient Arts to research and design an interpretation centre looking at the use of materials from woodlands in prehistory. This has now developed into Centre for Rural Life in Anglesey. The centre would take the form of a small enclosed settlement, as would have been found on Anglesey approximately 3,000 years ago in the Late Bronze Age to Early Iron Age. A site at Melin Tlunnon was chosen, and evidence of how roundhouses were built was studied. This included visible remains of roundhouses, seen here as small circles of stones. The results of archaeological excavations seen here in plan are previously reconstructed roundhouses. Archaeological excavations of roundhouses have found the remains of stone and clay cob built houses and wooden stake houses. The latter survive only as circles of post holes in the ground, but from these we can reverse engineer the possible structures of these prehistoric homes. The design for the centre consists of two roundhouses and associated structures within a bank and ditch enclosure. The structure of the roundhouse is based on a cylinder shape forming the walls, with a cone shape forming the roof, making it a very strong building indeed. The first part of the build was to dig a circular pattern of post holes, which would take the uprights of the ring beam, which support the roof. This is one of seven upright supports of the ring beam. They are cut from oak trees, a strong and durable wood. First the timbers had their bark removed using a tool called a spud. This is a wooden wedge which levers the bark off the timber. At their bases the sapwood was removed and the ends charred. This makes the post less vulnerable to rot and wood boring insects so they last a lot longer in the ground. The first posts into the ground form the upright supports of the central ring beam. This is structurally the most important part of the house because it transfers the weight of the heaviest part of the structure, the roof, vertically down into the ground. Seen here from above, the central ring beams of both houses are taking shape. It takes 14 oak timbers to form each ring beam. Metal axes and adzes would have been used to cut and shape the timbers. The horizontal timbers of this heptagonal ring beam attached to the vertical posts using lap joints and were pegged together using oak pegs. Mortise joints may also have been used along with rope bindings. Holes could have been drilled using stone or metal drill points. A small hand drill would have been used for fine drilling as seen here with a stone bead. A larger, more effective bow drill like this one would have been used for bigger jobs. Towards the end of the period, pump drills may also have been used. Once the ring beam had been formed, the rafters were put in place. These were made from ash, a light but very strong wood. Supporting the rafters at the apex of the roof was a king post. This is a vertical oak post that ran from the ground to the apex and the ends of the rafters. At the top of this a timber tension wheel was built to support the rafters. Once all the rafters were securely in place the bottom part of the king post was cut off leaving only a stump within the tension wheel still in the roof. 64 nine and a half meter long ash rafters and 64 seven meter long supplementary rafters were used in both houses.
The experimental nature of the build is illustrated by the fact that more were used in the roof of the second house than the first when it was realised that this made the thatching easier. Another wood extensively used on the build was hazel. Its flexibility and strength made it ideal for forming the purlins or cross pieces onto which the thatch would be laid. Walter Reed was chosen for the thatch because it is light and durable, lasting up to 30 years if well maintained. During prehistory, heather, wheat, straw and turf were also thought to have been used as thatch. Walter Reed was tied onto the purlins in bundles with the horizontal ridge roll defining the bottom edge of the thatch. At this time, plant fibres were twisted to make strings and ropes. Interesting. And then you see a natural sort of king starts to form. Yeah, that's the king. So we're just twisting clockwise with this hand and quick lifting clockwise with that hand. And you see the rope starts to form. This rope was made from willow bark and is strong and flexible. Working up from the bottom edge, many tons of reed were used to complete the roof. At the top, the thatch was loosened and thinned to allow smoke from the hearth in the roundhouse to escape while still remaining waterproof. Many prehistoric roundhouses had porches at the main entrances. One of the reasons for this may have been because an entrance or a gap in the structure weakens it, making it inclined to twist around. A substantial porch at the entrance counteracts this twisting motion, thus stabilising the structure. As you can see, some of the largest posts on site anchor the porches. Excavations of roundhouses often find items associated with craftwork near or in the entrances. This is because these areas would have offered good natural light necessary for fine and detailed work. The walls were built using upright oak posts with hazel wattle woven between them. These form the basis of very strong walls. Daub made from one third straw and two thirds clay was then mixed and applied by hand to the wattle. It goes on from both sides at the same time to bind the wattle between the daub. Once the wattle is covered by the daub, it is allowed to dry, forming a windproof and strong wall. Other prehistoric roundhouses in Wales, like this one under excavation, had low stone plinth balls onto which clay cob walls could have been built. Cob walls are made from a mixture of clay and straw compacted together and are at least a metre wide, providing excellent thermal insulation. However, if they are not protected from the weather, they soon collapse, leaving little evidence apart from spreads of clay. Cob walls continue to be used in house construction in North West Wales to just over a hundred years ago. Here, on a course run at the Llanon, volunteers make one of these stone and cob walls. The internal floors at Llanon had the topsoil removed and were mechanically hammered and rolled to replicate the compacted floors found during excavations of prehistoric houses. Stone cobbles are sometimes found around areas of high wear, such as entrances. Roman period accounts of roundhouses talk of floors being covered in straw and animal skins. The Clunon roundhouses are set within a bank and ditch enclosure. This type of settlement is often called a defended settlement, as the bank and ditch would have offered a formidable obstacle to attack, especially as there is evidence that they may have contained a very unwelcoming thorny bushes. The enclosure would also have been useful in controlling animals, keeping them in or out, and would have provided drainage for the site and possibly even the site toilets. During excavations of the ditches near to the entrances, artefacts such as bones, sometimes representing the remains of whole animals and whole undamaged pots, hint at possible ritual practices taking place here. The ditch and bank would have been seen as proclaiming the status of the family group living there. As we have seen, the manpower and access to the materials involved in building the roundhouses and closures would have been significant and require many skills. <laughs>